funny melancholy triumph or a genuine connection, etc.? That's a very good question. It's, in fact, it's sometimes I bring this up on my own. Uh, the scene where um, I take Hal apart reminds me of a famous American author, Steinbeck, who uh, 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 wrote during the, uh, the Depression of the 30s, famous author, um, wrote a play called Of Mice and Men. How many of you know Of Mice and Men? It was a famous movie. In fact, they, I think they re remade it with Malkovich, made it the second. Anyway, Burgess Meredith was in the original. And if you remember, Burgess Meredith's friend is this retarded, big retarded fella. And in the film, he inadvertently uh, causes the death of a young girl. He just doesn't know his own strength. And uh, what a key part of the film is he always wants his buddy, which is Burgess Meredith, to tell him how they're eventually going to get a ranch. And, and he says, I can't remember the character that Burgess Meredith is, but well, oh, it's Lenny. George. Lenny. In, yeah, but Lenny's the, Lenny's the retarded one. And he said, George? Tell me, and we're gonna get rabbits, right? That's right. And and, and we're gonna get the horses and the bunnies and, and, and we're gonna have a real ranch, right, George? And George, that's right. Well, what happens is they're gonna string if they catch this poor fella, they're gonna lynch him. And Burgess Meredith's character knows it. So he's gonna put him out of his misery quickly. So while he's telling the story for the probably the nth time, he has a gun hidden behind the man's head, and he shoots him uh, to end his misery. And in a way, to answer your question, when I take Hal apart, it reminded me very much emotionally of a man, because I think we've become accustomed, you know, this film, uh, the, our part of the film, it's not like the first day of the trip. We've been there for months and months, and the rest of the crew is in hibernation. So the only live, quote-unquote, characters on this long trip are Gary and I and Hal. And we're talking to Hal all the time. If you remember early in the film, I'm showing him some artwork I've done. So in a sense, I always, I always thought that it was sort of like Burgess Meredith's attitude, a very ambivalent attitude toward taking Hal apart. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here with my extension English class, and we're studying 2001 as a text. And I was wondering what you think um, the impact was of 2001 on science fiction as a genre. I didn't quite hear the question. What's, what's the impact, do you think, of 2001 on science fiction as a genre? What was the... The impact. The impact of... The movie's impact on science fiction. Well, you know, I think up until that time, science fiction was... Uh, there were some good, a few things. But nothing of nothing that had the impact of 2001. 2001. I'll quote Buckminster Fuller, uh, actually a friend of mine. who was a brilliant man, you know, the geodesic dome. And Bucky Fuller always said, you know, when you're traveling in space, you're on the attraction of one in a, a planet or another. I mean, if you go to the moon, at some point when you're X distance from the moon, you're now in the gravitational pull of the moon. That's how you travel in space. Circular routes like. And the point that I'm trying to make is that 2001 always had a massive impact in America. Massive. Sociological impact. I, I can just give you an example uh, uh, of how it played. In the, I had people come up to me and say, I was in med school, I dropped out. I was, you know, I was going to do this, and I became an engineer. I, then I went to... I do, I've done a lot of autograph shows. Kier's kind of new to it. I got him to come out eventually. <laughs> the thing is, I used Recently, to Recently, in 98. <laughs> <laughs> well, for years I've tried to get him. But anyway, uh, there's a show, a fantastic show. In fact, the man who's putting this on uh, came there, Scott. Scott, you're the Aussie man who has, who's brought us here, who's brought us, responsible for all this. Um, it, it's called Comic-Con, and there's 135,000 people, and you can't get a ticket, and you can't park, and it's in San Diego, California, and you can't even get a hotel room. It's unbelievable. And uh, I've been there about seven or eight times signing autographs in the last 25 years. And I'm there one, was it 
Thursday. Uh, I'm there one Thursday. Thursday afternoon, I'm sitting in a booth and I'm signing autographs. And two young guys come up to me, about 27 or 8. They look at me and they go, God, Gary Lockwood. I mean, you know, I've been an actor a long time. You, you never know what they're... I saw it in an Elvis movie or I saw it in Star Trek. Or, you, know, you don't know what it is, you know, they're going to say. And he said, my God, that movie you made is so unbelievable. How many of those photos could I get? The big one, you know, the big one we have, where a computer reach our lips, we call that the flagship. And he said, how many of those could I get for $500? So they were a little bit cheaper in those days, and so I gave him a figure, and I threw in extra ones. The next day he came back, he bought 500 more. So now, I asked him the next day, I said, look, are you a dealer? Are you, uh, you know, there wasn't so much eBay in that time period. But are you a dealer? Or not? I mean, ask for a dealer discount. I'll take care of you. He goes, no, no. I'm just a private guy here in San Diego, my friend and I. I said, oh, okay. So on Saturday, he comes back, and he buys $600, and I give him a whole bunch of extra ones because, you know, here's $1,600 to one guy. It's just a fell swoop of the pen. Wonderful thing for me. And um, so about two years ago, not two, well, you were there last year. About three years ago, I'm at Comic-Con, and the, the guy comes up, but he's not with his partner, he's just alone, and he says, hey, how are you? And I said, I'm pretty good with faces. And I said, hey, are you? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm the guy. <laughs> I said, where's your buddy? He said, well, he's out on business. I said, hey, you know, I've often wondered, what, what did you do with all those? He said, it was the greatest financial move I've ever made in my life. <laughs> I said, $1,600, what did it do for you? And he said, well, we were writing software. We were a young company. We were just fresh out of, you know, computer programming and all that. And we sent those out to every potential person that we would have some sort of business type intercourse with when, and we sent them out. Those happy, uh, we, we sent them out as Christmas cards. And we put our sticker on and he said, we, we got all kinds of reactions because the whole computer world, I mean, 2001 in the computer world is like, you know, you can't get any higher. I, I just was going to add one thing to young Betty Mike. We, two, a very direct effect on science fiction specifically is that it paved the way for big, but there had never been big budget science fiction. They were grade B movies. All science fiction films made before 2001 were kind of grade B films. And it paved the way for Star Wars and everything else that's come since. There's some, uh, some good material for your essay. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Uh, so I guess I just really want to know, I mean, for a decent amount of the film, basically the entire middle and end act, you two and are basically you're the only human reference points for some pretty complex themes and some pretty interesting special effects, some of which you saw, maybe some of which you didn't. How did you deal with that? How did you, how did you manage being the only sort of human reference point? And your reactions were so important to us as to, to interpret what was going on around you. Well, we're all different. I went back into London and saw beautiful women. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we really didn't go to Jupiter. <laughs> but, you know, you don't, you don't, that question really is from the observer. I mean, you're, that, that comes out of having seen this film and appreciating this film. But as an actor, you don't think that way. That's, that's an objective point of view looking at us. But we're playing a character, you know, as I said, this is just another day. I, the film begins just another day in our lives of being in space for months and months and doing our mundane jobs, whatever those jobs would be on a space on a, on a spaceship at that point. And uh, you know, you don't. I mean, you, if you ask real astronauts that question, you know, how do you feel just being so isolated? In you know, we were isolated, but we were used to it by this point. We've been our characters. Stanley Kubrick uh, envisioned um, that astronauts would not necessarily come from the military, but that we had, we had double doctorates, 
uh, our characters. We had a background uh, of, uh, of science and also that, that they would, that the powers that be would have their eye on young people coming up and for their psychological profile. And so what kind of event that would, would turn most of us into, to, into an insane asylum, if it was violent enough, would only bother us a little bit, you know? I'd like to tell this young man how cool astronauts really are. Because we've signed shows, we, Kira and I are about the only actors that ever go to autograph shows with all the great astronauts. You know, we've done maybe eight or ten shows. And they, they know us, they loved our movie. And some of them became astronauts because they saw the movie. That's true. And the, I've always, you know, loved the space program, I mean, candidly. And I've read about it all my life, and since I was relatively young. And let me tell you something how cool Neil Armstrong is. When he got selected to be the first guy to step on the moon, this was no accident. He was the top of his class. He was everything. Neil Armstrong flew a damaged fighter plane in Korea back to the ship that was in pieces. And he saw the ship, and everybody said, Neil is the greatest pilot that ever lived. And they said, Neil, he said, okay, he had contact with the ship, and he just dumped the thing in the water, and they picked him up with a chopper. He fell asleep. It's a true story. He, Neil fell asleep. We met him. I met him. I met him in Houston. Yeah. And, and Neil fell asleep on the launch pad when they were going to the moon. <laughs> and, so, and somebody, I forgot, one, one of the guys, oh, my friend Rich Surfoss, Rich Surfoss said to me, uh, he said, uh, you know, they had to go through all these check systems and everything, and somebody said, hey man, wake me all up, we're going. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just to give you an idea. I thought you were going to say he fell asleep during the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? He had a good answer. <laughs> Smarter than I am, he's young. Mm. Uh, this is probably more a comment than a question. Uh, Dad asked me how many times I've seen this film. And, uh, I stopped counting at 24 and I've seen it many times since. And talking about your jump cut, I've never once watched this movie and I've been caught by surprise by that scene every time. Uh, but uh, as a question, I guess when the uh, when it was all over, I guess you, you absolutely thought that, okay, that's it, that's the last we're going to hear with this film. And you never thought that all these years later you'd be still doing um, events like this. Did we think, so? did we think that it, we would have this after effect? Did you think this film would last, what, how many years? 30, oh, oh, 40, I don't 45 think we, years? I don't think. You know, I did two things in my life, Star Trek in 2001. And they both never seem to go away. <laughs> I mean, I'm grateful. I'm here in Australia because of it. But this is a 2001 crowd. I've never done an autograph show and not sold one Star Trek. Hey, <laughs> uh, I've just got on a question about the characterization. So when Kubrick gave you directions, I guess, about your character, what kind of, um, what kind of characterization did he want you to give the characters in it? Did he want it to evolve over the time, especially in regards to um, Bowman and when he has a conflict of how. And did you ever consider like ideas behind science fiction when you were considering how to portray your characters or not really? Well, uh, I think I partially answered that in the sense that we, I mean, uh, we had these backgrounds, we each had double doctorate degrees, we knew that we were psychologically profiled in such a way that we were what would make most people excited would we would remain calm through most events that would happen. I think the only time I really showed any emotion at all is when Hal wouldn't let me in. Um, but even then, I somehow, other than forgetting my helmet, 